What is my toughest loss? Every time I lose EVO Grand Finals is always the worst. It's always the worst feeling. Playing on that stage is if you're if you're in it for the long haul. Like if your goal is to win and you know you can make it to the end, it, it really tests your, your mental fortitude. I, I really want to win EVO. I can't quit playing competitively until I win EVO. Fighting games are games where you play against another opponent. You use um, attacks like punches and kicks and special moves to dwindle down your opponent's health bar to zero, and that's how you win the game. There's usually characters with multiple different fighting styles, and you pick whatever is your favorite and you play against people. I guess you have to compare it to other types of games. So. Unlike platforming games like Mario and Mega Man, it's just you playing, you finish level, you beat a boss, you move on to the next level. FPS, it's usually you against the computer in campaign mode, but then once you go online, you're on these teams of like two, three, four, five plus, and two teams play one another. Fighting games are kind of unique in the way that it's it's one on one always. Two men enter, or two women enter, and one, one leaves, one emerges the champion. Two different people, two different skill sets being thrown in one area together and seeing who comes out on top. And by I say two different people, of course, we both think differently. We both have a different outlook on how we're going to go about certain things. And skill sets be, being what we do in the game, whether we pick a certain character or the tactics within inside the game or the mechanics and stuff like that. Really, it's about having a game where you have enough utilities and enough options to be able to craft something out of the characters or the the avatar that you're controlling that you can outplay somebody else and and develop this very strong high level mind game mental game i mean i, I hate using the term high speed chess because it's kind of a generic way a lot of people describe it but in a lot of ways it is it's about outthinking your opponent and uh, out strategizing them. And it's really a lot of it is very psychological. I think that's one of the things a lot of people don't realize about fighting games is all you see is the buttons and the joystick and what the character's doing on screen. But the thing that you really miss out on is how much is going through a person's head when they're playing, how much they're trying to figure out what the psychology is. Is this a defensive opponent? Is this an offensive opponent? Does he get scared easily? Is he reckless? When your opponent reads you, uh, it gets in your head and you're like, does this guy know exactly what I'm thinking before I'm thinking? So the thing that I think I should do in this situation, I maybe shouldn't do in this situation because he knows that I'm gonna do that. And once you go down that road, a good opponent can really exploit it. So you have to, you have to believe in your reads, you have to not second guess yourself too much. It gets to this point where we have these competitions and you're playing against these people that play for hours and hours and hours each day and they're in each other's heads as they're playing and you can actually see it happen. It's great. When there's a good match, you can like see in each player's head and beautiful things happen. Oh! He got a hit but not able to oh. the match! The match! Oh. Can he finish? Will this combo can kill? Can he finish? He can! He can! He can! He's alive! is back! You know, there's a lot of different subcategories in fighting games as well. Really, the distinction kind of just comes from the basis of how the games play. So there's the basic 2D fighters. Those games are played very horizontally, and it's very um, flat. You really just have this understanding concept of you're on the ground, you have the jump attacks that you kind of attack from the top, and you try to face each other. It's mostly about spacing and distance from your opponent. When you have games like anime games, these games take place in a larger space because there's a lot more super jumping, a lot more air dashing. With 3D fighting games like Tekken, Soul Calibur, and Virtua Fighter, going up into the air is like not even something that you really think about. It's mostly just little hot kicks is the most, but outside of that, it's a very 
actual 3D kind of thing because there's a lot of sidestepping, there's a lot of dodging. It's very appropriate to even mention the Smash Brothers games now because they're their own genre now. And these are completely different because they don't even use standard life bars. All the games that I mentioned already have standard life bars that you drain. But in Smash Brothers, you're just trying to knock them off the stage. So it's really the basis and the fundamental mentalities of these games that actually define the little genres inside them. And it's why we have so much variety. And, and personally, I just think it's awesome that it, that it is that should way. should be it. He's going to run out of meter you to gotta watch out for the Dragon Punch. got to watch out for a DP. Yay! A fighting game is something that you, you, you experience not just by yourself, but with friends, with enemies, with people that you love, people that you hate. That's really what a fighting game is. It's like the embodiment of, of everything that you try to do to outdo another person. It's like you want to be out on top. You want to, it's, it's competition. You want to be the best. You want to be able to outsmart everybody. You want to be able to show everyone that you have the skills, you want the fame, you want the fortune. It needs to have a way to put yourself in the game with the character that you love. It needs to have the head to head. It needs to have the, the saltiness. It needs to have the, I need to beat this guy I'm sitting next to. If it's got two life bars and, uh, you know, whoever loses their life bar first and one emerges and then you do it over again, you probably got a fighting game. Wow. The FGC is an acronym standing for the fighting game community. It's an encompassing term for multiple different groups of people around the world, multiple small clusters of people who get together to play fighting games. That fighting game community encompasses anybody who really plays fighting games. So whether you play a 3D game or a 2D game or a Street Fighter or some really obscure title that people haven't heard of, you're part of the fighting game community. It's changed a lot over the years. So I guess I can give you a really old school story, um, which was like, as far as I know, the first online fighting game community was in, there was a news group called rec.games.videoarcade. And once Street Fighter came out, uh, the chat about Street Fighter got to the point where it actually sort of took over the group and people were complaining like, there's all these Street Fighter threads, why don't you idiots get a room or you know get your own place and and so we did and that became altgames.sf2 that to me was i guess the first experience of there are video games and here are fighting games and sort of separating those and and making it its own kind of thing people from all over the world play fighting games and they travel to events everywhere in any country pretty much to play against each other and kind of meet up with friends that you wouldn't normally see on another basis it was really meeting up with strangers on the internet. That's what really it was. It was kind of awkward, especially since I was growing up. Uh, I was still a teenager at the time, and when I had to explain to not only my parents, but also my other friends at school that, hey, I'm not gonna be free this weekend. I'm going up to some place 10 hours away to meet up with some guys uh, I met on the internet to talk about fighting games. And that was really um, a weird point of acceptance for when I was growing up. The players getting together, the competition level, the the traveling, the, the camaraderie, just everything in one equals the FGC. People learning how to play, new people getting into the scene, you know, parents bringing their kids. Like, it takes a lot to sum it up. I just can't find one perfect word. Sometimes I explain to people, because I, I travel a lot for these events, and so I'll tell random people, oh, I'm, I'm flying out to Florida this weekend. And they're just like, why are you flying out? And, like automatically now I have to be like, well, there's the sub community, you know, just depending on the person, it can be very easy to explain. Oh, that's cool. You know, and then other people are like, people do that with video games. You know, <laughs> most of the time, what I just try to tell them is that it's just, it's a very cool competitive community. Uh, we have tournaments and uh, there's a lot of like personalities in there, a lot of uh, pride and it's just super fun, you know, and that I, Probably the one thing that I always tell everybody is that I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't enjoy it so much. Close to Disney. Oh, he tried to fake the fuzzy there it is. But he gets the low strong stun. Gamer is this going to be enough? He wow, goes the for the fancy combo. And, and that's Gamer B. Unbelievable. 
for me, it's it's many things. Uh, it's 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 a paycheck. It's a uh, it's a way to make a living. It's also a way to to find your friends. Back when I was in college, uh, I swam Division One for Rutgers, and halfway through my career there, they cut the men's team. So I started going to the video game club, and I started playing fighting games, and it kind of replaced that camaraderie of the swim team that just got kind of taken away from me. On a personal level, you know. I guess coming out uh, was a really tough time to make for me. And people who are part of the Smash scene and part of other fighters, when I felt like things were done with my family and we were going to cut ties, they were the first to offer themselves up to me as a, as a second family, to replace my first family. And I will be eternally grateful for that. We've taken big leaps and, and we've we changed for the better and we can be taken more seriously. And of course, all this couldn't be done without, without prop. It's just a continuum of, of awesome stuff. And when I think of the FGC, I just think of my, my friends and, and uh, so many great friends from so many different parts of the world. And that's meant more to me than anything. It can definitely be whatever you, you make it to be. You know, like to me, I, I, I took huge passion and I have a huge love for it. So to me, I could say that it is my, my second family. It is my best friend. It, it, it is my dad. It is my mom. It is my family. But you know, some people could just look at it as it just being a hobby or just something to do. But I feel like I invested so much time in it and I got, I, I can't believe where I got in my life just because I, I like fighting games and I can play them decently, I guess. Um, but yeah, to me, that is definitely what, what we are. Definitely my family. Arcades were, uh, I think, critical to the early development of the scene because it was a social place, it was a shared place, it was a place that wasn't really for adults. Going to an arcade uh, didn't take a lot of money, it was open to you for sure. No one could tell you, you know, you're, you, you're out of here, you're, you know, you're a prep or you're a, you know, a burnout or whatever, like this is, it's an open space for anybody to come and play. They would get early access to the game pretty much, so the way games work is they're released usually arcade, then about eight-ish months later, they're released on console. So the people that don't have access to an arcade are behind because the people that live near an arcade get an advantage. So what that kind of did is if you look at if you look at the strength of scenes in the US, it's usually because there was an arcade there. So you have good fighting game players where these arcades were like New York, Texas, SoCal, NorCal. You just look at these different regions and because they had an arcade, they had the competition that was serious. Because A, you have to pay to play and you better be good or you're just throwing away money. No online, no social media. You had to come out if you wanted to play, baby. You know, you could say like there's more of a chance to play online than there would be in an arcade, you know. But you don't play with the same inspiration uh, online that I think you would necessarily in an arcade because you're not just playing to beat, you know, oh, I want to beat Iori 5739. It's, I want to beat that fucking guy. Like, that guy pissing me off. I don't like that guy. I don't like the way he plays. I don't like anything about him. I want to stay on the top. I want to be ahead of that guy. Let's say you get blown up by some dude and ranked on SF4. Like, you want to rematch immediately, but there's no kind of button to do that. And, and you can't just, like, wait in line and do it again because he's probably paired up with someone else, right? In arcades, like, you get rematches for as long as they're there and you have quarters, right? Um, so you get to build this kind of longer competitive history. And, you know, as you keep on losing, like, you, you start to develop a rapport with a person, you start to develop a relationship, and that simply isn't there to the same extent if you're not playing in a public venue. So I think arcades were a perfect illustration of that because a lot of those people became friends, a lot of them became enemies, uh, but it also engendered a certain kind of respect and a certain kind of attitude because you were sharing a physical space with them. So if you wanted to talk too much trash, you might get punched in the mouth. Like, you can only talk so much trash, like in person to, you know, teenagers before something's gonna go down. 
So it was both a bounding factor, but also a connecting factor that uh, I think really brought a lot of people together because you really got to know who someone was, not just through the expressiveness of a fighting game, but by seeing how they dress, how they talk, how they eat. So Chinatown Fair was an arcade located at 8 Mott Street, New York, New York. That's where you went to play good players. Whenever I would go, I would lose so poor, like so badly. No one knew my name. I was just known as Joe's friend. Like the guy who came with Joe, that, that's who I was. It took me a year. It took me from 2006 to 2007 to beat someone. And as soon as I beat that dude, his name was Mike. He played a purple Ken. People learn my name. When you're trying to be a good, you know, the best Street Fighter player you can be, for people at the best arcade on your coast to know your name, it's huge. If Chinatown Fair was a cologne, I would wear it. I can sit there and talk about CF for like ever. But once I got, you know, a little bit better and I got known there in like Third Strike, you wound up going there by yourself or with one of your friends and then going to China to, to go into food and then going home, where it slowly became to going there, meeting someone else there, and then instead them saying, hey, do yo, we're gonna go eat, you wanna come eat? And then you meet other people that they brought out to dinner and then different places to eat. Chinatown Fair was more of an arcade. Like that was a culture in four blocks. Like we were like a culture that spanned in four blocks of Chinatown. It was also a culture thing for me because I was an American boy who eats hamburgers and hot dogs. And now, you know, they're like, this is bubble tea and this is this and this is duck and this. I was like, whoa. You get to meet all these cool people from like places and ways of life and things that are just totally different from you. And so they had literally different ways of playing based on you know, their own local scene and the way that they approach, chose to approach the game. I think that mostly lends itself to the fact that, that fighting games are awesome, really. <laughs> I have no other way to explain it. The fact that something is diverse means that everyone can get into it. And that's really the great part about fighting games, is really anyone can get into it as long as they have the right mindset and they really just pay attention and they love it. The, the kind of democratic and, and open entry nature of our tournaments comes from the arcade culture, right? Because all you have to do to start playing is to walk up, put up a quarter, and wait your turn, right? It was, it was a beautiful thing. And it was the strength of those bonds, I think, that inspired the fighting game community to be one of the very first to sort of go online, uh, at least in terms of finding other players. It was because they were so compelled by the experience they had in their local arcades that Realizing that same kind of experience was happening in other little clusters all over the world was like really cool and you wanted to find a way to be a part of that and connect with more of those kind of pods. Let's go! It was definitely a newer market and people found interest in the competitive aspect of it. You had SNK knocking games out, you had Capcom knocking games out, then you had Midway who came along in the 90s with MK. 2004-ish, 2005-ish, it started to get a little, a little dry. We were playing the same games. Everyone was either playing CDS2, Third Strike, Marvel 2, but those games have already been out since 99. In one sense, that was cool because there's some of those games that are completely worth playing basically forever. Uh, they don't get old at all. But in the video game world and just, you know, video games are all about new, 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 graphics, graphics, graphics. Um, and that's the way you sort of can really attract crowds at the beginning. and Fighting games hadn't had that for forever. It was rough, man. It was like almost a dark period, almost a crusade. Like you had to struggle. I was happy to get two, three hundred people at an event. It was hard back then. By the time we hit 2009, like you, you were pretty sure that most of the people who are, who are around were kind of the diehards, right? Like if, if you if you were around and you're sticking around, you're going to be there for a while. We weren't getting a whole lot of new blood in. Kind of got dry, and then of course we have uh, Street Fighter 4. I remember where I was when the trailer came out. I was at Nassau Community College in a class. I don't remember what class it was, but I remember Joe texting me saying there's a trailer for Street Fighter 4. Go check it out. I ditch class, go to the library, and I find the trailer, and I start flipping out. Internet's blown up, and it really came at a perfect time. Street Fighter 4 was a linchpin because it was a numbered Street Fighter. There hadn't been one of those for 10 years, and it wasn't just a new Street Fighter with a bunch of crazy crap. It was 
directly looking back at Street Fighter 2 and like, here's the stuff that brought everybody to the party in the first place and we're bringing it back and we're gonna make it look awesome. We're gonna make it feel good. We're gonna, you know, bring back the characters that you know and love. It brought back all the people who played Street Fighter 2, at least for a little bit. They knew that someone was out there playing these games and kicking ass, but they didn't have an easy way to get into it, right? Street Fighter 4 became that. It became like, hey, welcome back. You know, we never left and we're here to show you how this game should be played. I remember being in Chinatown Fair and we had a, a quarter line bro with a piece of paper and the paper had like, I don't know, 60 names on the paper and you're only allowed to win six games and you had to get up to keep everything, keep everything moving. It was, it looked like the old days in the arcade in Chinatown, like Chinatown was packed. We were all there when the place opened, when the gate came up, we were all playing Street Fighter 4 and it was people who played Street Fighter 2, who played Street Fighter 3, who played Marvel 2, everyone who's ever played a fighting game is playing Street Fighter 4. So it had the nostalgia engine firing, it had the new cool graphics and look engine firing, it had the marketing hype and we're gonna do cool stuff around that, all, all in the right place, as well as a competitive community that had been sort of brewing for many years, sort of waiting for a chance to really be uh, fully inflamed. I don't know, I always, I always talk about it like, this was a fire that was burning all the time and kept burning brighter and brighter over time, but Street Fighter 4 just basically poured gasoline on that fire. And it was just done in such a way that like relaunched the fighting game community and gave us insane exposure. And it was so important. It just came out at the perfect time that it just worked. And because of that, the community evolved around this game. And since now Facebook and Twitter were out at that time, and gaining a lot of popularity in the mainstream, information was able to be disseminated so fast, you know, speed of light. I think streaming has been absolutely critical to the growth of the scene. So when you see something authentic, like that happens at these kind of events, I think that really shines through. And streaming has been a great way to sort of get that reality of what's going on here across. Because we can stream it, because we can share it, anyone in the world can look at this and be like, wow, that's something I want to get into. That's amazing, right? Because all this information was being shared, it made it easier to get better. It was like a fighting game revolution almost. And it was just super important to have. Being able to launch Street Fighter 4 was a big one for me uh, as well because there was so much of my life that I'd sort of, I'd personally sort of thrown away good stuff in my life to try and work on that project and then you really hope it's gonna be what it needs to be and then to see it and, and being played and succeeding is, that meant a lot, uh, just on a personal level, but also because it meant fighting games had a chance, had a fighting chance, again. My name is Steve Bartholomew. Also, my handle is Lord Knight. I am from New Jersey, central New Jersey, and I play Blaze Blue, Persona, and I also play Melty Blood. I didn't discover fighting games for a really long time. Like, I played Street Fighter II World Warrior on Super Nintendo with my neighbors when I was six, but it wasn't really anything serious. Like, we just kind of I played it for a little bit, and I'm like, okay, this is cool, and we played Mortal Kombat, and it was cool till my parents took it away, because they were like, what is this game? I didn't really get invested into multiplayer games until I moved to New Jersey, and Super Smash Bros. came out. That's like the first multiplayer game I played like really intensely with my friends. The first time I really used, really, really like interacted with a community for a competitive game was for Smash Bros. And that was on Smash Boards. I went to the regional boards to try to find somewhere where I could play. So it was like the first time I've ever left my house to go play video games with people I never met. So I was like a little nervous about it, but I was like, can I come to this? It's not that far. This guy gave me his address. My sister drove me out. It took three hours, even though it was half an hour away because the street leading into his neighborhood didn't have a sign. 
kept driving past it over and over. And she almost gave up. And I think if she gave up, I probably wouldn't be talking here right now because that probably would have been it. But I was like, let's go in this warm place that we haven't gone in before. And like, that was the place. And they were all super, super nice to me and like welcoming. So it was, it was a really good experience. And my track to playing fighting games started when I went to MLG in 2006 to play Halo. And we didn't have a team. Our team bailed on us. So I figured we should just enter Super Smash Bros. Melee because we're the best players in the world, obviously. So let's enter this tournament and win a tournament. And I went like one and two and I was devastated. It was crushing. I got motivated. I was, I was like, I'm gonna be the best Smash Bros. Melee player in the world. But while I was playing SSPM in high school, I met this kid named Mark who really, really like, he had a lot of fighting games on his tablet and he had Guilty Gear Sharp Reload and he showed me that game and I was like, whoa, this is a sweet game. So that was like the first fighting game I really played. The Smash scene was really big at Rutgers and this is about a year after I started playing fighting games and they'd always have these gatherings on Livingston uh, for Smash. Randomly, uh, one day, uh, we're playing, we're playing in my dorm room and we're like, oh, let's go downstairs and check out the Smash tournament and see if any of Guilty Rear players are down there so we could go back up to my room and play. And then in the corner of the room, there's this kid with a laptop playing Melty Blood and Gio, my friend at the time, he's like, whoa, that's Lord Knight. And I'm like, who the hell is Lord Knight? So we go over and we're like, oh, you know, you want to come up to the room and play Guilty Gear? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll go up. Like, I think I remember how to play, right? He bodies me free. I found out he lived close to me. Uh, one day I invited him over to teach me Melty Blood. I'm like, come over, body me a Melty Blood. Like, let me, let me learn the game. So he came over one day, and I think since then, we've, we've just been friends. We travel ever, we've been to Japan together, like we traveled over there. Uh, I help him when like, he needs a hotel room or a ride somewhere to a tournament. It's, he, he's just my friend now. Blaze Blue is Arc System Works' most serious production, I guess, in the past few years, like what they've been focusing on. It's a really complex game with a lot of subsystems and a lot of depth. So it's kind of just Arc System Works' brainchild of just them doing whatever they want in the scope of a fighting game. Air Dashers or anime games are different because one, it has air dashing. So you go back all the way to like, Street Fighter. It's like it's two people, they walk back and forth, they can jump once, you can't block in the air. Like in the 2D games, Street Fighter KOF, jumping is a very spare thing. You try to reserve that because it's it's a big risk and stuff. But in a lot of these other games, jumping and going into the air all over the place is a very common thing. So that actually produces a very different kind of game. Obviously you can move through the air, you can jump more than once in the air. Some characters can air dash twice, jump three times. It's like it adds, it adds more movement options to the game. So when people look at an anime game, usually they're looking at the mechanics, but it's also the look of the game because uh, they were made in Japan. Originally, they were drawn in 2D art. You know, they have the big eyes, the, the different color hair. You know, they're crazy looking. There you get much more sort of over the top moves, sort of the screen is now filled with crap or I am turning into a 30 foot robot or I am feathers all, I don't know, it doesn't matter. There's there's you get a certain element of zaniness and more over the top, it's much more fast paced. It's usually a little less readable um, unless you're familiar with the franchise, the anime, or, or just play the game a lot. You know, why are there feathers shooting up from the ground? Why is this guy now red and 20 feet tall? That stuff doesn't make a lot of sense all the time unless you're familiar with those stories, but uh, they're a ton of fun to play. <laughs> The main reason I play these games is just because I like them <laughs> more than anything else. I, I got to play Street Fighter 4, the arcade version of Street Fighter 4, and I guess it, it didn't really grab me right away. I didn't appreciate it, I should say. I didn't appreciate the game for what it was. I just thought it was a simple, way too basic game the first time I played. As far as Blaze Blue and Persona, the games were fun like from the start as opposed to like the other, some of the other games I played, which didn't really grab me until I stopped playing and I watched the game evolve and I was like, oh, but they didn't grab me from the start. That's what I need. I want to have fun too. I don't want to just be serious all the time. Like I want to have fun. So if the games aren't fun, then I, I just won't play. The biggest thing that keeps me playing right now is I have goals 
ever since I started playing just competitive games, period, I always had like goals for myself that I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to win tournaments. I wanted to win the large regional tournaments. I wanted to win majors. I wanted to win SBO. I wanted to win EVO. There are divisions. There are locals, there are regionals, and then there are majors. So locals typically take place at an arcade or you know your local gaming center since we don't really have arcades anymore. A regional is something that's typically a weekend long, uh, one or two days. People travel for it and it has you know a lot of competition, a lot of good competition, but it's still like either the prize pot's not big enough or it's not an established tournament. And then you have something called a major and a major is an event that when you hear the name it's like, yeah, I know that tournament because it has an established reputation. It has, you know, a big prize purse. It has a lot of sponsors. Everybody knows to go. That, that's what we consider a major. And then after a major, you have something like Evolution, which is considered like the world finals of fighting games. Because you have people from dozens of countries around the world, thousands of entrants, and that's kind of where the world's best is defined through that tournament. Up and throw up here. This time it hits, and we have our champion, Mango, first place. We had Evolution 2014 first. Evo is the biggest and baddest fighting game tournament in the world. It's really the big show. It's like the Super Bowl of fighting games. To my old school ears, Evo is the rebranded B series of tournaments. EVO now is basically a direct outgrowth of that. Um, so the scale is, I don't know, not even a hundred times bigger. It's actually more than a hundred times bigger, I think. But actually that's one of the only thing that's changed. The format, I think, is almost identical. It's still a double elimination tournament. You still pay money into the pot and the winner takes it home. Um, and it's still put on by players. EVO, has never had any full-time staff and still doesn't. And every aspect of this production is from the sound to you know the videos to the stream to the setup, it's all just a bunch of players. And that's pretty cool to me. Evo is the culmination of fighting game fans everywhere. It's crazy how it, it, it was a small tournament that no one knew about and it's become a place where now game companies are highlighting and making announcements and really uh, using it as a platform to not just reach out to the core community, but also to media worldwide. And there's millions of people that watch it year over year now, and I think it's amazing how much just Evo has grown. Now, I still remember the days when we got 100 people in a tournament, we were like, what is going on? This is the most fantastic thing ever. Between all the games, we'll probably have 4,000 players maybe competing in all these games over the weekend. And, and that's what makes it the big one, is just that you know if you can survive through this gigantic armada of players, that you know you are truly one of the best in the world to be able to make it through and win. Oh, 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 he got it, he got it. If he finishes it, it'll be over. If he finishes it with the grab, he'll be over. It'll be over, it's over. Got him. I went for the first time last year, and I've been to a lot of majors at this point, but EVO was just an unbelievable experience. I, I, I didn't think anything like that could really exist, but just going to EVO for the first time and experiencing it, it, it was the greatest thing, you know, the greatest thing I've ever been a part of. It's, it's more than just the biggest fighting game tournament in the world. It's one of the best events you can possibly like experience in your life. I think. EVO, 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 EVO. Most of the people here probably don't have a serious shot at winning the competition, but coming here and taking a shot and knowing that it's open to anybody to come and take a shot at the best in the world is pretty awesome. And that sort of, I think, captures that old arcade spirit, uh, which is where we all came from, which is anybody can play. Um, you know, you've got a quarter in your pocket, you can walk up and play uh, against anybody else who's here and take your shot against them. My motivation right now is pretty much I, I really want to win EVO. I can't, I can't quit playing 
competitively, like seriously, until I win Evo. So that's like the main thing. As the SGC grows and it gets more exposure and more coverage from mainstream media, I think that some issues that might come along are just the word fighting games. Um, a lot of people who don't really play games in general just hear the word and kind of cast it off as this is something that's violent and not something I would want my kids to play or you know parents might not see it for what it really is. To be honest I don't think we're given a fair shake. I think that media have tended to focus in large part on a few high profile um, stories of fighting game players behaving badly and I think that's unfortunate. Um, because there's a really rich community here, there's a lot of great people, and the fact is that we're doing something different, we are a different community, we're doing different things than a lot of other um, kind of video game communities around there. The community does a lot more good that uh, I feel like everyone outside the community doesn't get to see. Everyone outside sees all the negative stuff and, you know, whether it's a sexual harassment issue or the portrayal of women in the scene or the game or guys and violence and testosterone or whatever, it's all, it's those, those small, you know, like the one bad egg spoils the bunch kind of thing. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's real in the scene and it sucks because it's not really, not like that at all, man. Everything, no matter what scene you're in, there's always something that could, you know, spoil a bunch. Whenever we're portrayed negatively, it's really a wake up call for us to like better ourselves. And if we don't heed to that call, then it's really our fault. If we're gonna fuck up, we're gonna continue to fuck up. And but I'm, I believe enough in the community to know that whenever there's something bad that happens, that we'll we'll learn from it and we'll move on. I've been really glad to see that, like in general, uh, games media, at least, even if they don't know how to play fighting games, then they don't really understand what's going on here. They're starting to see that as like a liability, right? Like. Any website should have someone who knows what's going on at EVO so they can cover it or so that they can cover the stories coming out of that community. So I think things are changing. I think it's very easy for mainstream media to attach itself to something negative and really bring the negativity out more than the positive. So if we can just constantly have positive things highlighted in mainstream media, I think the FGC could practically get a facelift off of something like that. We're getting better you know, as a, as a community and I think that extends onto the media where they see us as better people, as a better community, and you know they want to support us more. So that's good. Um, I can't say it's always been good, but like I said, it's getting better. I was born in 85, so Atari was the shiz in 85. In my parents' room, was the Nintendo for the most part, because my dad used to be really into like Castlevania and Zelda. My brother played Zelda a little bit. So I was exposed to games quite early in life. I remember the 7-Eleven used to have arcades. Not sure if anybody remembers this, but 7-Eleven used to have like, well, at least the one by me, it had this little offset in the 7-Eleven. There was like a little space corridor area. And then I remember the 7-Eleven got Street Fighter. They had two and then Championship Edition. Yeah, after that, whatever, wherever we went, wherever I could go, whether it be a mall or arcade or a bowling alley or a diner, like whatever there was an arcade game, especially a fighting game, I wanted to play it. We'd give him a couple of dollars, wait outside, and he would go in. I really didn't know exactly what he was playing, and uh, he would play games for maybe not even a half hour. Uh, the money would be gone, and we would go get ice cream or something, and then uh, we would go home from there. And uh, as we continued going, and he got a little older, and not much, as months and months went by, the money that I gave him started lasting longer and longer. At first, he would be done in a half hour, and then it was like an hour, and then it was like two hours, because he would, and he started getting very much into Mortal Kombat. Tons of blocking. That block button is getting some serious man. use right now. Timeout. Man. This might be a timeout, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, going oh, by timeout. Holy sh! That's not good enough. So I met Long Island Joe back in 2002 or 2003 when I used to play Dance Dance Revolution. I remember, like I was a short fat kid back in the day, so I would always try cutting the quarter line. I was that annoying arcade kid no one liked. I remember one time I tried to cut the quarter line. And he just looked at me, shook his head, and handed me back my tokens, said, you better wait. So that was my first interaction with Joe. As time went on, I was no longer annoying, and I kind of grew up, and then, you know, we started becoming friends. But then DDR started dying out, so I never really saw him anymore, and he didn't work at Funzone anymore. Probably like 2005 or 2004, I started playing at another arcade, FYE Games, out further east on Long Island. 
And then I saw him again out there, but he looked completely different, very approachable at that point. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, do you remember me? We used to play DDR at Fun Zone. Of course, he remembered me. And uh, yeah, that's, we became friends at that point. He taught me Street Fighter, we played DDR, and now we're kind of like brothers. Joe, uh, John, uh, hello. Uh, the filming of the filming? The filming of the filming of making the filming of the movie of the film. East Coast Throwdown is a, an event that I run with uh, Joe, and it started actually in two ways. So for a while, during the Third Strike era, I was running something called Castle Fight Nights. We became too big. We had almost 100 people in maybe a 25 square foot space. It ran really well, but it grew every time. And I said to the owner Lance, I said, dude, we can't do it here anymore. It's too big. And there was no place on Long Island that we knew about that could fit us. So I stopped. I was always like, dude, do a major, you can do it, we'll run a major, I'll help you. Blah, 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 blah. Typical John, great. And then one day, sitting at home, I have AIM open, this is in 2009, and uh, a person messaged me. We'll call this guy Mike. He was a friend of me and Joe's who, he knew how to scam people. He knew how to like get one over on people, he was a good salesman. And we remember going to Evolution East 2007 in Connecticut. I remember him saying, how does this work? Like, how do these guys make money? We told him, well, you know, they'll charge a venue fee. That's how they get their money back. And then you pay $10, that gets put into the, to the prize purse for Guilty Gear, say. He's like, all right, so here's what we could do. We could run a tournament, do all that, and then we'll just like shave off the top of the Guilty Gear pot and make money off that. I'm like, dude, that's not how it works. That's stealing. But he didn't see it that way. So fast forward to 2009, sitting home on AIM, get a message from Mike saying, hey, I noticed you're not running tournaments anymore. And I said, yeah, you know, they got too big. I can't fit anywhere. So I had to stop. He's like, oh, that's a shame. Just want to give you a heads up that I'm running something big, but I got major back. I said, all right, cool. Good for you. Signed off AIM, called Joe immediately and said, we got to do a major. And that's how East Coast Store was born. It took us a few shots to get it right, but um, now I think it, I think it goes, it goes very well. The last few have run like to me, I think they run flawlessly. Running events was something I was never really into. I never really wanted to. I just wanted to play, dude. I didn't have any, <clears throat> any drive to run anything or stuff like that. And uh, I don't wanna say I didn't care, but I feel like there were other people doing it. Like, you don't need me to do it too. You know, there's plenty of other people that are doing it. But um, then John wanted to run a major. And I, I don't wanna say John needed my help, but I offered the fact that I could help him. You know, I could, you know, like get the community. Cause I, I had, I guess, stronger ties in the community at the time. We came together, our powers combined, Captain Planet. My whole involvement in the actual TO aspect of the scene is definitely because of John. You guys are the best. I like John. We're trying to get this. This is CEO of Bad Imperial. Best tournament I've been to in five years. Good shit, guys. Thank you, everyone. Yay! All right, so we started East Coast Throwdown in 2009. On 25, like I said, I went to school for air traffic control. Uh, that was my plan. So I realized, you know what? Ever since I was six, I've wanted to work in the video game industry. I mean, I remember when I was six, I said I wanted to be like a Nintendo tester or something. But I know how to run events, I know what I'm doing. So I built my resume up and I started sending it to companies. Because of that, if I were doing events or community management or something full time, I would not be able to run these tournaments. So it's because of that that I have to walk away. I'm not saying that I'll like forget about the fighting community, not be involved, but my job is done. I've laid the groundwork for these events. You know, I've been part of the team and I can move on and the events will be fine. John and I have this saying where I would be the artist and John would be the architect when it comes to running the events. I have the ability to think about it and plan it out and kind of put it on the paper, but John can actually construct it and he can, he, he's a lot more patient than me. He has the ability, he's actually a lot smarter than I am too. He has the ability to make these you know, he, he's so calculated, he has your spreadsheet, he has your this, he has your that. I'm not that calculated and or anything else like that. So it's, it's you know, having him around is, is, a, is a huge, a huge importance, man. So we'll see how it goes without him. I just want the community and everybody else to know the importance of John and his input in ECT. That's, that's my, my goal this year, to make sure that everyone knows that it's not like it, it shouldn't mat. It shouldn't not matter that he's leaving. Like people should honestly 
sit and think about all the stuff that he has done and all the stuff that we together have put into it or I or he helped me or I helped him and I just want people to realize that it's not you know it's a lot bigger deal than what someone might seem it to be CEO has been pretty good so far. I came yesterday, there are a few people here. It's a very friendly atmosphere. Everyone is cool even if you don't know each other. It's fun, it's fun so far. This weekend I'm going to play Persona 4 Arena and Blaze Blue. The best case scenario would be me winning both games. That would be the best case scenario. It's not imperative that I win this weekend. Like everything is practiced before EVO, so if I don't win, then I can figure out why I didn't win. Uh, was it me? Did I just mess up, like execution? Did I get angry or flustered and do something dumb? Like I could figure that out. But if I win, uh, people will be more conscious of me, which will probably be for the better. LK is undeniably one of the best players in the United States of America for all anime games, you know, uh, Blaze Blue, Persona, Melty Blood. What makes him a strong player is he labs it up a lot. He goes in the practice mode with his character, optimizes his combos, figures out small nuances with matchups, and really, really fleshes out the game. Like, just lays it out, figures out every little mechanic, every little nook or secret about it and he just tries to have the most knowledge about the game because honestly the stronger players are going to know more about the game. Come on LK. I like how I look for the three skills. Okay, combos okay I like this. Out. Is she going to cover her tech options? Yes! Thank you LK. To be honest I think people don't think I'm a good player really. I just, I know I'm not a really exciting player to watch. I just managed to win with or I just beat people. I don't do anything really exciting. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> so, um, yeah. Hold that. Ooh! <laughs> okay, and there she's I want to say, I want to say, yeah, I think the general consensus is that we want to see, you know, new faces in the top spots of tournaments. It's, I don't want to say it's boring. It's great the players are consistent, but it's almost more fun to see like good players or the best players lose. And uh, I want to say maybe outside of the Northeast, the general consensus is that, yeah, we want to see LK lose. He sometimes loses to a wild play style. Like he'll, he'll just get hit and then He'll try and calculate, or sometimes he just won't care. He like does 50-50 sometimes, where he'll play like a nut, sometimes he doesn't. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> Who is he gonna get the perfect? Oh my god. He's gonna overhead him. Just go, yes! Woo! Baby! And I want to, like you say this because he's your friend. Like you want to say, oh, he's better. But there are players that like are on his level that he'll lose to. And it's mostly because sometimes he just doesn't say, you know, F it. He's just very calculated. And if you throw him outside of that, he kind of loses some of his strength. So there is two extra prizes for Blaze Blue at EVO. There is a $25,000 pop bonus from the creator of Blaze Blue. And then there's also an additional $5,000 and a trip to Japan for the highest placing American player at EVO. There's a huge pop bonus and that has huge incentive for people to travel and people to also travel from overseas. So a lot of the Japanese are coming, very, very strong players, the best in Japan are coming and all the best players in the US are coming minus a handful. So what this means for us is this is finally a time when we get all the strong players together in one spot to see who is the best. And on top of that, the best U.S. player that places gets to go to Arc Revo and they get to choose their partner for the Blaze Blue tournament. So we finally have um, an American representative at the big Japanese tournament for Blaze Blue. It's probably one of the tournaments I'm, I care the most about since like EVO 2010, I'm pretty sure.
Uh, of course, the money is a thing, but I haven't won an Evo, and even if I don't win, if I outplace all the other Americans, I still get like a really, really good prize, a chance to play in the Japanese national. I think out of all the players that are going to Evo, he probably, uh, the American players, obviously, he probably has the best chance to win this. You know, I'll, I'll never, I'll never count LK out. He always, he always, he never ceases to uh, amaze me. So I, I think he has the best chance out of all the American players going to win. Never, never really a bad idea, bro. What? Oh my gosh. Must have been a misinput. There's no way. Do you think, uh... Do you think Juggernaut's controller broke mid-match? <laughs> Is he gonna give LK the round? Next round? No. It's already over. Oh my gosh. Four players doing the exact same thing. Fireballs, traps. Whiskey three siege. Doesn't get punished. And the 6A, the god. Oh, oh really? my god, Fennekin knows! He knows! Fennekin! Oh, oh my god! And Fennekin is dancing! So East Coast Throwdown 2014 has gone pretty well. Uh, Friday night was a little crazy. We had some issues with the venue where we didn't get certain things that we were contracted to. You know, we just worked really late, got 90 minutes of sleep and got right back up in the morning and kept going. Oh, we had a pretty good turnout. Actually better than I thought it was because, you know, it's Mother's Day weekend and stuff like that. So it went, went a lot better than I thought. Um, ran pretty smooth. Everything's been on time for the most part. Uh, people haven't really had many complaints from anybody. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it. I am. Events like this are super important for the community, I think. If you just take a look around, it's everybody just hanging out. It's a great place to meet friends, you know, get back together with old friends that you haven't seen. Maybe they moved to a different state or another side of the country or, different, or a different country. It's really good to just kind of come together, play some games, win some money, and hang out. These events are some of the most important to the community because it still, it still shows that, you know, the, the players, the dudes that still have, you know, nine to five jobs are still doing things like this. It's not, and I know Capcom can do it, they can do Capcom Cup, but that like is their job, you know? It's cool to see, you know, the dudes who just have passion for it to make sure that we can all come together and we can share the passion, you know what I'm saying? And this is literally what community means, meeting people with uh, a similar interest and making connections that last a lifetime. Oh, all man. right. 40, 46, but it loses. Wow, Raw Spear, oh, man. he just did it. He just did it. Now, Joe is yes, up by fatality. one. Yes, yeah. The crowd is going wild. This is why we play UMK3, ladies and gentlemen. So this event is important on a lot of levels to me since it's my last event. Uh, at last East Coast Throwdown, I should say. It's been tough, like especially today since it's Sunday, this is the last day, and in, in about an hour I'm gonna get on that stage and tell people this is my last East Coast Throwdown, <laughs> so. I mean, John is definitely my ride or die partner, but he is doing something to better his life, and I could never take that from anybody. You know, he's, he's doing the right thing. He has a passion just like we all do, you know. So I have to respect it, you know. I, I'm, I'm not mad about it, so obviously I'm happy for him. You know, I, I mean, when you know, he always talks about it. Oh, dude, I got an email, someone called me, someone said something on my Twitter about it. So he really is all about it. And I mean, like, there's nothing, there's no greater achievement than doing something that you love to do on a grand scale. And I'm not doing this to like, be like, oh, well, I'm leaving, so watch it change. I'm doing this to say, I'm leaving, thank you for, for everything you know that you guys have supported me with. And I want people to know that, you know, I wouldn't be what I am without this event, and this event wouldn't be what it is without the people who come here and support us and support East Coast Throwdown. So I don't really know how it's going to go and what the reception's going to be like. Um, part of me doesn't really care, because it's, it's it's more for me just saying thank you and letting people know that I'm thankful. Um, so I don't know, I really can't predict it. Hey, we got John coming up, Rick, come on. All right, um, guys, if you can do me a favor, please, guys in the building. Uh, if anybody is playing casuals and not turning me, please do me a favor and just hit pause and stand up for two seconds. 
I just want everyone to really pay attention about, you know, give us your full undivided attention. You know there's teams going on over here, which I totally get, but um, don't be mad if I cry or anybody cries. All right? Um, John? Holy shit, that's a lot of people. Okay, so in 2009, uh, when Joe and I started ECT, I was 19 and he was 22. We had no idea what we were doing, but it's because of you guys that we figured it out. It took us three years. God knows ECT3 made me want to quit, but we got through it and here we are in a ballroom three times the size of our original space at the Western Governor Morris. We have two giant screens for you to watch all day, working with Team Spooky, the best in the biz, Deadly Bison, our friends from Long Island, Combat Network, all the guys we've met have really helped us, that's right, all the guys we've met have really helped shape us into who we are. Now, I'm not sure if a lot of you guys follow me on social media, but you notice that this year with ECT, it was a little quiet. And that's because after we wrapped the Fall Classic, uh, last year in 2013, uh, I started really focusing on my career and what I want to do with myself. And I decided that that is going to be my main focus. And unfortunately, this really sucks. This is my last ECT. This show will go on. There will always be ECT. <laughs> um, so I wanted to do it here and it'd be very personal because you guys have really made me what I am and I'm eternally grateful for that and I cannot thank you enough for supporting this event even if it's even in its dark times and when it was rough you guys kept coming out and supporting us and supporting East Coast Throwdown and you guys are the reason it's as big as it is so thank you. As I was as the words were coming out of my mouth it felt correct to be doing it it was tough especially when I like when the words came out saying like, this is my last ECT, I looked at the crowd and everybody was like. <sighs> Listening to the speech, I remember paying attention to more of the people than really looking at him because I already knew what was coming and stuff like that. And uh, I'm just really glad that, that the people in general really understood what was going on. We are still as tight, I just don't see him as much, I should say. You know, he has other things going on, other avenues in business and you know, more eSports stuff and things like that. And you know, I'm very proud of him. I'll back him up with whatever he wants to do. You know, we've been through too much for, you know, me leaving a tournament to come between us. And he was extremely, like, insanely supportive of me leaving. When I told him that I wanted to leave, he was, without hesitation, he just said, okay, sure. If this is what you want to do, go for it. I back him up on whatever he has to do. And uh, I know he's not gonna stop until he, he gets it. And I hope he does, I hope he is successful. And I hope he gets to live his dream and stuff like that. I mean, that's what I would want for any of my friends. So um, the one thing I can say is just don't stop, and if you need me, you know I'll help you. We're at EVO, yes, it's day two. Yesterday I won Melty Blood and Persona. At the same time, top eight, top eight was at the same time for both games. So I'm feeling very, very good right now. Oh my gosh. I'm not saying that Kind of suck. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my Ooh. gosh. Uh, oh, the bait. Oh, wants that burst. Oh, Lord, there nice. we go. So my first game is uh, against a Kagura player from Toronto, Bill 307. To get out of the pool, I'll either have to play a Hockeyman player from California, I believe, White Boy Willie, or the Twitch-sponsored Japanese player, Koji Kog, who plays T-Hawk in Street Fighter, but he plays Tager in BB. And I watched him play BB, like I watched his videos from last year and his very recent videos because apparently he stopped playing, which is a good sign for me, but it's still like a grappler. KOG stands for King of Grapplers, so it's about, it's about as hard as you can get besides the actual, uh, the guy who couldn't come, Masuk Grandia. Good. Oh, what, what, what? Please say no! no! So that is, um, that might be difficult. Best possible scenario, um, somehow making winners top eight. That would be the best case scenario. Uh, worst case scenario, I'd have to say losing in pools. Uh, not like getting out, well losing of course, just like not making top eight is the worst case scenario. But things that could happen to 
caused that. Losing once in pools and getting out, having to get out from there, I think is the worst case scenario for like EVO, period. Uh, it will take a lot of games for me to get to top eight if I lose in pools. So I really don't want that. Fortnite, of course, strong tournament presence for the past half a year, year, two years, three years. He's he's been a very dominant air dasher player, and I'm sure this Evo is no exception in terms of his own perspective of how he's going to do in this tournament. Oh yeah. But Diana's got his legs though. Oh, that's a big drop. You can kind of see the nerves showing up. Yeah. This is a like you got all, all the chips on the table. Nice. Do it or lose it. I'm loving his neutral right here. The great back dash. Call the back well. dash. Maybe, maybe he's calming down a little bit. Here. Oh, oh no! What? Side switch, fatal, fatal counter, and all the meter to work with. Teleport. And he teleports out. out. They're both right. down to first. first. Very even. Very even. Fireballs clashing. Even equal setups. They're, wow. <laughs> It's Jayuna coming down a little bit, which I do like a lot. With burst. Awkward trade, does not get picked up. Calls the back dash. I like that. It's a very safe call. Corner push. Wow. Whoops, the overhead's too far. Gets some pressure. Burst, but he does there. All right. He's got one chance. Super Bowl. He's putting all his hopes and dreams into Tech again, three. and Lord, I catch the 6A camaraderie. They're both so impressed by that match. Goes to the wire. America takes it. I got 17th, which is the lowest place I got in a tournament that year. Yeah, my lowest placing of the year was at EVO, 17th. The guy who beat me did make top eight. I don't feel too bad, and it was really close, but uh, I mean, I was still, I'm a competitor, like I was still upset about it. It was like last game, last round, like last situation. Like, hey, if I'm right, I win and I move on. If I, if I lose, like that's it. I decided not to like back that. I think that's that's what it was. I decided not to backdash, and he hit me with like a, an overhead, like a media overhead, and I lost. 
and the moment he hit me with it, I was like, man, I should have backed that because that would have been, I would have, I would have won. I moved on. I mean, you could do two things. You can take the loss, just be mad that you lost and like keep playing, or you can take the loss, see it. I mean, it sucks that you lost, but you have to grow from it. Like fighting games is about growing. Competitive gaming really is about growing. Like you improve yourself. So the only way you can improve is I mean, it's very cliche, but through failure. And losing in tournament is pretty much about as straightforward of a sign of failure as possible, I think. You know, one of the questions I talk to myself, I ask myself all the time is, you know, where's the, where's the future of the fighting game community? Where are we going? And honestly, I wish I knew. I want it to be huge. I want it so that everybody on the streets knows what a fighting game is. I definitely would expect the FDC to grow and grow and grow as the years go on. Um, we have other esports games like League of Legends who are absolutely dominating right now. They get thousands and thousands of people filling up stadiums to watch their game. And I definitely don't think that the FGC is far from that. I feel like we're only gonna get bigger. There's, there's no way we can really get smaller. There's no way you can be in this community and say like, hey, there's no fighting game I like. There's too many fighting games. There's, there's so many that there has to be something you enjoy. There has to be something that you like. Fighting games are never gonna die. If there is a new fighting game, I would go wherever I had to go to try and play it. And I don't feel that dying within me anytime soon. And I hope, just hope that a lot of the other players who are here feel the same way because, you know, it's going to go hand in hand. If we're not playing them, if we're not creating this energy within the game to make people feed off of it, and they're not making the games for us to make that energy, then everyone's screwed. You know, that's what I'm saying. We, we have to work together, everyone, and this will go as far as we take it. Sky's the limit, man. With all the people around the around the world hype to make it to these qualifiers and qualify and everybody wanna watch it, man. It's going there, it's gonna go there. It's gonna go there, man. And I believe with Capcom help, tournaments like Evo and stuff setting a standard for us, I don't see no I don't see no limit. If if the average layman can realize how skillful these guys are and how much time and dedication, how much talent these guys have. I would love that. That's what I would like to see. I don't know. It could go it could go a lot of ways, but in one sense I care a ton and have invested like a lot of my life into making that future. And on another hand, I couldn't care less because I think what is already happening and what has already happened has value and has real value uh, regardless of what happens. So maybe this will become the most popular, uh, you know, spectator thing in the, in the planet. I don't think that's gonna happen, but if it did, that would be amazing. But I think it actually does have the potential to do that because, you know, whatever. I played sports, I've watched a lot of sports, and I've, you know, live music and, and bands and all that stuff is great. I personally have never found a thrill like I found in the room at these tournaments. Uh, in terms of the camaraderie, in terms of the display of skill, in terms of just the electricity. So I think it absolutely has the capacity to reach those kinds of levels. I'd love that to happen and I'll fight to make it happen, but I think everything we're doing now uh, is, is great. It's already great and I hope the world catches on to that greatness. But if it doesn't, it's the world's mistake and not ours. My goals this year are pretty much the same as last year and every year. I want to win EVO. Some people told me, you did it. Like, now you did it because I won Persona last year. But I don't really count it because it's like a side event. Like, I, want, I still want to win like a main ticket tournament. That's still like the goal, like the, the main goal going up at least to July. Win Evo. Remy Pierre, Remy Pierre, you just ran up right at Please come to the center station. Remy.